Okay. Uh, okay. So we're going to talk about the initials today. So, it, you know, broadly speaking, the methodology is, is the same as we did with the vowels. So first internally reconstruct um, middle Chinese and then look at Sheisheng evidence. Uh, and we, we can't look at rhyme evidence in this case, right? Because the initials are not a, uh, you know, are, 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 are not relevant for the study uh, or yeah, when you rhyme things, you're using the vowel and the coda of a syllable, you're not using the initial. So the poetic device that, that would be useful for studying initials would be um, alliteration. But as far as I know, uh, Chinese uh, hasn't used alliteration in a systematic way like Old English did. Um, so it's not, um, you know, so, uh, so it's only really internal reconstruction and Sheisheng evidence in the first instance that, um, that uh, helps us reconstruct the initials. Okay, so first then uh, the internal reconstruction and we will uh, remove some things. So we'll remove H uh, and the palatal affricates and the retroflex stops. And we will add labiovelars. Uh, so here goes. I, I think I mentioned this in passing, just in terms of you know uh, to 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 exemplify how we use internal reconstruction uh, to go from Middle Chinese to Old Chinese. But we notice that a voiceless velar occurs in both type A and type B syllables. That voiceless aspirate velar occurs in both type A and type B syllables, uh, but that the voiced velar only occurs in type B, and uh, the, the, the H, uh, which is probably a, a gamma, I mean, this is one of the confusing things about Baxter's um, uh, um, transcription, but uh, the H means uh, something like a, a voiced uh, velar fricative, that occurs only in type A syllables. So we see a complementary distribution, and then we think, okay, we can do internal reconstruction and propose that uh, G changes to gamma in type A syllables. So now we've gotten rid of, you know, gamma uh, for old Chinese. Now we look at uh, the palatal affricates, and we notice that uh, dental stops initials only occur in type A uh, rhymes. Uh, and the palatal affricates only occur in type B rhymes. So then uh, we can uh, suggest that uh, the, you know, that type B syllables are a conditioning environment for this palatalization. And we don't have to reconstruct uh, palatal initials to Old Chinese. And now just a notational thing. So you're aware, um, uh, division three syllables in Baxter's system have some kind of Y or J in them. Yeah? So you can always notice division uh, three because of that. And then, um, and, and divisions one and four are unmarked in his, in his system. Uh, whereas in old Chinese, Baxter and Sagar write Type A with this little pharyngealized, uh, you know, this little raised, uh, you know, you see it in the T, right? Uh, and uh, and then Type B they don't mark. So I think for our purposes now, we don't need to feel commitment to this uh, phonological interpretation of the Type A Type B distinction, but you can just treat it as a handy. Uh, way of, of indexing con the conditioning environment. So you see that, you know, uh, uh, dentals come from type A dentals and palatal affricates come from type B dentals. Okay, now a look at uh, the origin of L and the retroflex consonants. And we hit on a, a little bit of this before, uh, but there are two vowels, the A vowel and the 
a vowel, which both occur in division two, uh, that um, that do not co-occur with. No, I'll just read that. With yeah, so dental initials don't occur with these vowels, and only very rarely with uh, L initial. And these vowels, which are division one and four, uh, don't occur with retroflex stops. So Yachendorf proposed that uh, the dental and retroflex initial classes were originally the same, because this is again a sort of complementary distribution. So we can write it like this, that, um, that L comes from R and that TR, well, comes from TR. But this is a place where Baxter's transcription is a little unhelpful because the TR in Middle Chinese means a retroflex stop, whereas the TR in Old Chinese means a T followed by an R. Yeah? So that's why I put the retroflex stop in, in, in brackets. So uh, and then and then also I'll just say that like as 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 an aside, you, you'll the, the um, so Yachendorf actually uh, I think he originally uh, looked at this and I or actually I'm not I don't want to say that it might have been Polly Blank because Polly Blank and, and Yachendorf kind of proposed this around the same time. Um, that that what I'm trying to get at is why do we reconstruct the L as an R. Why not just leave it an L? Well, uh, at this point, we can say, because it seems sort of more normal to take retroflex initials back to a, a cluster with an R than to a cluster with an L. Um, um, but uh, we will also want to use L in Old Chinese for other things. Um, uh, so, and I mean, there's also uh, some direct evidence, but um, uh, yeah, just to say that, uh, you know, I don't think that this change of R to L is a big deal, yeah, um, and uh, doesn't need to bother you. Okay. So, and then similarly, the retroflex affricates originate from affricates followed by a medial R. So that was that's kind of the the R hypothesis, right? That R that medial that medial R explains both division two rhymes and retroflex initials. Now on to labial velars. If we look at uh, the distribution of medial W in Middle Chinese, it falls neatly into two categories. The first is uh, checked rhymes that occur only after velars or glottals, uh, and these are the rhymes in question. Uh, and I'm giving the, the name of the rhyme in pinyin, followed by the characters, oops, uh, followed by what the, how the rhyme is represented in um, Baxter's uh, transcription. Okay, and there are no uh, middle Chinese syllables, you know, of of the types you see on the screen, which is which is to make the same point basically that uh, acute initials don't occur with these rhymes. Now the second class is uh, all other rhymes. Uh, which appear freely with all initials. So um, these two distributional classes imply two different origins for W. So I will just call them kind of mechanically W1, which only occurs after velars and glottals, but with any rhyme, and W2, uh, which only occurs in certain rhymes, but with any initial. 
So, uh, and, and, and you might notice that these, these statements of W1, W2 are a little bit different than the, they're the mirror image of the distributions I was talking about between initials and, and, um, and rhymes. And that's because uh, I'm presuming that uh, in some contexts, we can't distinguish the two, right? So after velars and glottals, W1 and W2 merged. Um, so Audricor was the first person who then said, well, you know, W1 seems to have this special relationship with, uh, with, uh, velar initials. So maybe uh, it's from labiovelar consonants. So, uh, just, just to give you some examples. Yeah. So we, you know, I mean, you can almost see this as a kind of rewriting rule mechanically that going from middle Chinese to old Chinese. We, we take the W and we put it upstairs as a superscript, yeah? And this also shows you, I mean, this is a nice, I think, uh, a case just in terms of simple examples. So how, how we sort of notate Middle Chinese and Old Chinese differently, where the, the type uh, A syllables, we add the pharyngealization uh, and then prefer using IPA characters to, um, to sort of standard Roman characters. Okay. And then for the moment, we will presume that there were also labial glottals because you, you know, if you if you if you just follow the way I've been doing things, then you have to, right? So um, the, the the same, these special rhymes uh, that uh, have a, a medial W and only occur with uh, um, velars and glottals, well, if we're going to reconstruct it as labial velars, then we also need to reconstruct labial glottals. And then some of you will maybe feel uncomfortable with that. I do, at least, uh, from, for phon phonetic reasons, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. So, so don't let it bother you. Okay, so if we just take the initials of Middle Chinese and we uh, do these moves that, that I've already explained, which is we we get rid of the palatal affrogates and we get rid of the retroflex uh, consonants and we add in uh, labial velars and, and labial glottals. This is what you get as an inventory. So this is a kind of, um, yeah, a, a good place to sort of pause and take stock of our progress, which is to say this is what you get from internal reconstruction before looking at Sheshong series. And uh, the, the, I mean, these are the type B and these are the type A, they're the same, right? It's just that the type A we write with the little pharyngealization marker. Okay, I also forgot to mention that we, we get rid of the, the, the voice feel of fricative too, right? So you see, it's, that's what we have. Okay, so, uh, I mean, I, I feel like it, maybe it's a little early and there won't be any questions, but might as well, Give a try uh, because it's a kind of logical break in the presentation. So, any questions? <laughs> okay, no questions. I guess I will go on then. So, now we're going to. Um, you know, look at Sheshong series kind of with this uh, progress we've made in mind and see what happens and come up with some other proposals. So according to the, the Sheshong hypothesis, I, and this is not in, well, yeah, I should say, last time I talked about the Sheshong hypothesis as articulated by Duan Yutsai, which is that if two things are in the same Sheshong series, they, um, will they would have rhymed in old chinese poetry well there's a sort of corollary to that which you will have already sort of seen evidence for and and will continue to see evidence for in a minute which is that uh, sheisheng series tend to have homo organic um initials so you know initials from the same uh, place of articulation um and uh, then that observation that tendency 
has been sort of uh, you know paraphrased back as a methodological principle where um, where we say that a Shechung series should have initials only from the same uh, point of articulation. Uh, so Shechung series that mix middle Chinese pronunciations uh, with non-homoorganic initials provide an opportunity to explain the divergent middle Chinese pronunciations as phonetically conditioned developments of old Chinese readings with homoorganic initials. So it, it's a kind of internal reconstruction again, if you'd like, but now we're not going from the distributional patterns of, uh, of, of, of middle Chinese you know, itself, but we're, we're, we're working from trying to fix uh, those places where the, the work we've done so far does not yet bring the initials into conformity with the Shesham hypothesis. Okay, so some uh, examples. Uh, here we have a Shesham series where you have a, a ya initial and a dra initial and a da initial. So uh, we're, we're looking for something that can explain uh, this. And um, uh, this is what you know, uh, Baxter and Cigar propose, building on an idea of polyblanks, which is that initial L develops into ya in uh, type B syllables and uh, it develops into D in type A syllables, and this kind of funky cluster, lra, uh, develops into uh, the retroflex, uh, um, voice retroflex in initial, stop, uh, in type, both type A and type B, which is why the, the little um, pharyngealization thing is in, in brackets. So that's their hypothesis. And look, it cleans up this Shesheng series nicely. Yeah. So now the initials are all, uh, you know, homo organic. Okay. We can also propose a voiceless resonance because there are some Shesheng series with predominantly voiced resonant initial readings that have the occasional character uh, with an obstruent, uh, a voiceless obstruent. So let's look at some examples. Yeah. Uh, uh, just to tell you a little bit about my conventions, no one has, has been bothered by it, but the, the number after a character, so here like 2415A refers to its number in Schussler's um, 2009 book which lists all the Shesheng series. So it's a kind of a, you know, unique identifier. Um, and it, and the first number tells you actually it's sort of rhyme class in his analysis. So, so it's in sort of rhyme class 24 in his analysis. Uh, and then the 15 um, uh, tells you the specific Shesheng series under that class. And then the A is which character in that series. Yeah. Okay. So here we have you know, contact between the, the voiceless uh, velar fricative X and the voice velar uh, stop. So the proposal is that we had, you know, a, a, a voiceless uh, velar resonant that in type A syllables changed to a voice, uh, sorry, a voiceless velar fricative. Uh, and, and now again, we have managed to make uh, the initials in this uh, Shechung series, home organic. Uh, and then I just give one example uh, from, from type A and one example from type B. And I'm trying to be sort of systematic in that way. In some cases, you can get both type A and type B examples uh, within one Shechung series, but in other cases, you need to look at different Shechung series to get both types, which is what, what I'm doing here. So there we have our voiceless velar uh, resonant, yeah. And here's an example for um, for uh, M. So uh, voiceless M in both type A and type B syllables again becomes a voiceless velar fricative, 
uh, and you you see this you know this evidence of it from the Shishong series. And um, I hope this works, but when I'm when I'm talking about Shishong series, I use a, a bigger font for the Chinese characters, hopefully in order to draw your eye into the actual structure of the character, so that you can see like, oh yeah, I yeah, the second character wholly contains the first character and they have kind of similar pronunciation. So probably the, the first character is the phonetic determiner of the second character. And then we try to make them fit even better with this uh, uh, hy hypothesized sound change. Okay, and now voiceless uh, N. So here we get uh, some more complication. Uh, so it changes to a th in um, in type a syllables and to sh in type b syllables and uh, before an r to uh, uh, this aspirated retroflex uh, voiceless stop. And I don't know. I I feel torn between sort of talking you through each one uh, and it being boring or just say, well, you can see it immediately. Uh, and it being maybe too fast. So let's just look at the second uh, group of three. So we have uh, here the word for you know, a woman as the, as the, you know, origin point of the Sheisheng series. And it has an NR. And then the, this, the second character has uh, N, uh, both of those in type B. Uh, and then the third character starts with sh, sh, right? So how does it, how is it possible that, why would anyone link, uh, uh, you use uh, an N sound as the phonetic determiner in a character that's read with sh? Well, maybe it's because it starts from, a, a, you know, in old Chinese, a voiceless uh, nasal. Okay, so then uh, we can also have our voiceless lateral here. And in type A syllables, uh, it turns into T. And in type B syllables, it turns into SH. And uh, here you see I'm relying on the earlier discussion of laterals. So we have, I mean, and, and this is a nice Shesheng uh, series in, in terms of how messy things can look from the perspective of Middle Chinese. Because you have in one phonetic series, you have ya. You have da, you have sh, you have ta. It, it's quite a mess. It's quite far from the Sheshang hypothesis. Uh, but we can um, say, okay, uh, we have this theory of, of uh, sound change where they all were initially laterals, uh, the voice laterals in type B and type A, and then the voiceless laterals in type B and type A. Okay, so that's it for the, for the laterals. And here we go with uh, the rotix. So type A voiceless R uh, changes to TH. And um, type B voiceless R to TRH. Um, yeah, and you see the the evidence here. And and this is where, you know, so jumping back a little bit, you know, um, you see when we initially proposed reconstructing a medial R to explain the division two vowels and the uh, retroflex initials, it seems a little bit kind of arbitrary. Like, well, you know, why R? Why not? Um, why not L since the, 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 the argument is based in part on uh, the fact that, um, you know, that, that, that L initial doesn't occur with, um, uh, with the division two, for example. Uh, well, now you see how uh, I, I think it becomes plausible as part of an overall system, which is we have work we want the R's to do and we have work we want the L's to do. Um, and uh, that, that it all gets a little bit simpler if you assume that, uh, so we started with this, with voiceless R's and voiceless L's, had all these sound changes that I'm describing, and then kind of late in the process, 
those remaining initial uh, R's just change to, to L. Yeah, okay. So now just to kind of give you a, 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 a bird's eye view of the voiceless resonance. No, first actually I'm gonna discuss the intellectual history. So um, Dong Tonghe uh, first proposed this voiceless resonance idea uh, only for the uh, the labial nasal, so only for M, yeah? Uh, and then Polyblank extended it to velar nasal, to labial velars, to dental nasals, uh, and so on. And then Baxter added the voiceless rhotic. Okay, so, and then, and then you know, Baxter and Cigar keep all those ideas. So here's the, the bird's eye view. Uh, which uh, hopefully makes the proposals seem a little less ad hoc, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, let's even try and paraphrase what's going on here. So in type A syllables, the, uh, the grave initials, and <clears throat> this, these terms grave and acute, they come from Roman Jakobson, uh, and are based on uh, the, I, the, the observation that in many patterns in, in language, labials and velars have something to do with each other, and then kind of uh, stuff involving the roof of the mouth has to do with each other. So we can, broadly speaking, uh, divide consonants into the graves, which, which are the ones at the front or the back of the mouth, or the acutes, which are the ones kind of in the middle of the mouth, this terminology seems to be quite out of fashion now in kind of phonological circles, but uh, we use it in old, old Chinese. Uh, of course, you know, Roman Jakobson what, didn't have the Chinese in mind at all, uh, but Baxter uses it a lot in his 1992 book, and I do think it's quite uh, helpful. So here, you know, we, we, we can use those terms to see why the, 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 the divisions are where they are in terms of outcomes, right? So um, the voiceless resonance in type A um, uh, that are grave turn into voiceless uh, velar fricative, and those that are acute uh, turn into uh, dental, voiceless dental aspirated stop. Yeah? And then in type B, uh, it's, it's quite similar. It's the same for the graves. And then in the acutes, we get uh, this further split with uh, voices N and L going to sh and voices all R going to tr. Yeah. Okay, so that's overview of uh, the development of the voiceless resonance. And now we move on to uvulars. Um, maybe b before um, this, I'll, I'll give you just a tiny sense of how controversial different bits of this are. So the uvulars, which we're going to get to just now, are quite controversial. So Baxter and Cigar are kind of a little bit isolated for believing in uvulars, um, whereas the voiceless resonance is, are, are much more widespread. They're in, for instance, Li Fang Kui's system. But uh, still, I don't think they're in Wang Li's system, so there, there are big parts of China where they won't be believed. But the, but, you know, the takeaway message, voiceless resonance, not particularly controversial, uh, but uvulars are more controversial. So let's look at the uvulars. Uh, we notice that there are Sheshung series that mix initial velars uh, and glottal stops or initial ya. So the, the point is, you know, that K, G, uh, R, and H are all in the same place of articulation. Uh, so they're, so they're homoorganic, so they're in keeping with the Sheshang hypothesis, but the glottal stop and the initial ya are in different uh, places of articulation, so they violate the, the Sheshang hypothesis. So we want to propose something to get rid of them. Okay, so uh, Pan Wu Yun is the first person who said, "Well, why don't we have uh, velar, uh, sorry, uvulars, to get rid of um, these?" And he had a particular formulation which I won't go into. Also, Baxter and Cigar had a, a, a formulation kind of different than his that was their own in around 2012. They wrote an article about it. 
uh, but then they change their mind and I'm only going to present it as their, their new version, yes, which is to say, um, even if you believe that using uvulars is a good way of solving this problem in the Schrödinger hypothesis, there's clearly more than one way to do it, but we're only going to look at the way they do it in 2014. Ah, but first, some positive evidence that these uvulars are a good idea. And this comes from uh, work of uh, Sasha Vauvins, Vauvin, yeah. Um, so there's a, these are both sort of titles of foreigners in the Han, yeah. So um, we have this uh, Hu Yu, uh, and there's it, like, so this is, this is a Vauvin's argument great uh, ruler is i don't i don't feel terribly comfortable pronouncing uvulars but is uh ga yeah in proto yenisean and it you know if you write those characters if you reconstruct those characters as uvulars oh look it matches uvulars in proto yenisean and similarly there is a title uh uh you know gen yu or something uh, which would reconstruct to uh, Dar Kwa, and uh, he compares it to Old Turkic uh, Tarkan. Yeah, so they're not. I mean, they're not perfect comparisons. Like, where's the N in 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 uh, the the second one? But I think they they do help build a case for plausibility of uh, of uvulars in in Old Chinese. Okay, so here are the proposals. A uh, 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 I don't know what to say, uh, a Q, a uh, voiceless, unaspirated uvular stop uh, becomes a glottal stop in Middle Chinese, whereas a, uh, a voiceless, aspirated uvular stop uh, becomes a uh, voiceless velar fricative. Uh, and that's, so that's, yeah, those are in some ways the, the more simple case. And then the voiced uvular stop, which is this capital G, uh, becomes the uh, voiced velar fricative, which we confusingly write as an H. Uh, and then here is some, uh, some evidence, yeah? So, if you just look at this series from Middle Chinese, it's a bit of a mess. Yeah, you have uh, a K initial, you have a glottal initial, and then you have these um, these these two uh, velar fricative initials. And uh, if you reconstruct it using the uvular hypothesis, uh, well, it almost works because because you'll say, well, Nathan, what about the the velar, you know, you, 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 okay, fine. We reconstruct the glottal as a uvular and we reconstruct the velar fricatives as uvulars. Uh, but then what about this, um, this velar? Well, we'll get to that, uh, but it involves uh, uh, this theory of pre-initials, uh, which is not today's topic, but, but basically to make a long story short, uh, if there was a pre-initial you, you, and you had a sort of vowel, uvular vowel, they think that that merged with velars. So, uh, and then the pre-initial was, was lost. So uh, you know, if you didn't follow that, that's, that's fine. But let's say there we will see the, that there is machinery for changing the velars in uvular series into back into uvulars. Okay, so um, now here's, uh, uh, yeah, just uh, the point that the, the capital, the small capital G changes to a voiceless velar fricative in type A syllables but in type B syllables, it changes into ya. So this, this is part of the, if you like, the overall pattern of palatalization that we see in type uh, B syllables. So now, um, yeah, the question is, did Old Chinese have an initial ya? And uh, Baxter and Cigar would say no. So, so far we have seen two origins for ya, and then I'm just gonna mention 
briefly a, a third uh, that involves pre-initials. So ya can go back to a lateral where in Shecheng series where it has context with dentals, right? So if you have a ya and a da in a Shecheng series, then you reconstruct them as laterals. If it has connections with uh, velar fricatives or with uh, velar stops, uh, then we reconstruct it as a, a voiced uvular stop. And then uh, there's also this option of, of um, uh, R preceded by a pre-initial turning into um, yeah. And actually that's, that's uh, kind of the same as the L because what they actually think happened is the C dot R changed to L and then the L changed to yeah, right? In type B syllables. So, they have these three origins for ya, yeah, and then they say, well, look, you know, if, if I have three ways of explaining ya yeah in Middle Chinese, I don't need to, it's, 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 it's Occam's razor would say, you know, decide among these three based on the Shichang connections, and we don't need to have a ya yeah in Old Chinese. But Axel Schussler and Guillaume Jacques disagree, and they point to this comparative evidence in particular. So, um, the, the old Chinese word for yang, sorry, the old Chinese word for sheep, which is uh, yang, uh, would reconstruct in Baxter's scar system to having a voiced velar, sorry, voiced uvular uh, stop initial. But if we look at other Sino Tibetan languages, the word for sheep uh, seems to have a ya in it. Yeah. So uh, we have this yang car, which would be like white sheep in um, Tibetan and uh, this Jatok form where the, the Zhou part uh, descends regularly from Yang. So uh, yeah. And then similarly, um, uh, there's a comparison is made to the, this word for itch, although we have to admit that the rhyme correspondence is not particularly uh, convincing for itch because Tibetan and Jatok, uh, you know, just have something like Ya, um, but um, Old Chinese has uh, yang. Uh, in any case, uh, looking at this evidence, uh, Axel Schussler and Guillaume Jacques think, no, don't, re don't just blindly reconstruct all of your yas to something other than ya. You know, in some cases, there's reason to think uh, that uh, Old Chinese itself had a ya. And now, um, I think Schussler would say Old Chinese had no uvulars. You should reconstruct all of these cases as yeah. Whereas uh, I think what Guillaume Jacques would say is, uh, yeah, he's perfectly happy with the three origins of yeah that Baxter and Cigar pro propose, but he wants a fourth origin of yeah, which is just yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now um, we 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 also have evidence for a uh, labio uvular. When you see a uh, series like this, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's what to say. It's the kind of series where we reconstruct uvulars because you have a glottal initial and it has contacts with velar initials, right? Uh, but uh, it's hooko, so which is to say there are, there are medial Ws and uh, it's one of those Hooko rhymes that we would normally reconstruct uh, labiovelars for, but we're going to reconstruct these as uvulars, not as velars. So we reconstruct them as labial uvulars, labio uvulars. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and if you uh, look at these examples, they just happen to be, I mean, at least as far as uh, we can tell. Uh, this is the claim made by Baxter and Cigar, and I've checked it to some extent. They just happen to all be uh, before front vowels. Uh, and then that means that they can still use the reconstructed uh, uvular, labio uvular initial for something else, which they do, and they say, okay, it becomes this, um, I don't even know how to talk about this uh, initial in Middle Chinese, but it, it, it's also like a voiced uh, velar fricative, but in uh, type, uh, B or division three syllables. Yeah. There's a kind of a, 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 a phonemic issue in Middle Chinese whether this um, is seen as a, 
separate initial or not, uh, but we don't need to worry about that. Uh, and um, a Baxter and Cigar then basically mechanically uh, project this particular middle Chinese initial back to a, a voiced uh, labio uvular stop. Um, and that, uh, yes, let's say, um, I mean, I don't know if it's a, it's a positive reason for doing so, but is convenient in terms of this initial in Middle Chinese basically exclusively occurs in type B syllables with medial W. And, and you see that that's a you know, natural, it, if it began life as what happens to a labio uvular in type B syllables, then that makes sense why it would only occur in those environments. Okay. And then just some evidence. Uh, we have uh, this series uh, where you see there, there is this, this initial we're talking about. Um, the HJ initial, then two velar initials, then two glottal initials, and this is good uh, evidence, or let's say it's the kind of series that we reconstruct as uh, uvulars, and in this case as labial uvulars. So um, I'll just sort of say, okay, take a good hard look at that series, and then we bounce back to this one, and you see, okay, so this change only before front vowels and this change before all other vowels. That's a kind of prediction, you know, that you could go through all the Sheshun series and uh, series with these kinds of contacts should only be uh, not with front vowels and series with the other kinds of contacts should be only with front vowels. So now, to give you the bird's eye view of uh, uvular developments. First, we'll look at type A. The voiceless uvular stop becomes a glottal stop. The uh, voiceless aspirated uvular stop becomes a voiceless velar fricative. The voiced uvular stop becomes uh, a voiced velar fricative, and then we get basically the same stuff, but with uh, the, the, with the labialization. So the labiovelar, the voiceless labiovelar stop becomes a glottal stop in a hooko syllable. The uh, aspirated uh, voiceless uvular stop becomes a voiceless velar fricative in a uh, hooko syllable, and the voiced uvular, uh, sorry, the voiced labial uvular stop becomes uh, a voiceless, sorry, a voiced velar fricative <laughs> in hooko syllables. Okay, I mean, you can see it on the page, uh, but I, I hope that, uh, you know, me reading it out is a little helpful to kind of have you uh, uh, think through it in, in your own mind. And that I don't, you know, misstate it too often. Um, but now we look at the type B syllables, which are a little bit more complicated. So uh, Q becomes glottal stop, QH becomes a voiceless velar fricative. Uh, so far, so good. The same as the other case. Uh, but the voiced uh, uvular stop becomes ya. Uh, then the, the, the next two are the same as in the type A syllable. So QW is, uh, becomes uh, uh, glottal stop. Uh, QWH is the, the X. Uh, but then, the, as, we, as was discussed before, but you know, just as a reminder, the, labio, the voiced labio uvular has a split where it usually becomes uh, this middle Chinese initial that we call HJ, but it also becomes uh, Y before the vowels E and E. Okay. So, uh, kind of, I shouldn't have put them in brackets because they're not optional. It's, they, they have to be there. But the reason I'm putting them in brackets is because 
Um, I don't quite know how to, how to formulate it, but because, uh, the, I mean, you see the Chinese characters, right? So if you look at the, the, the Chinese character, uh, I think it's called Ying, uh, it means shadow. Mm -hmm. It does not mean glottal stop plus W. It just means glottal stop. So that's kind of why I put the W in, in brackets. So, you know, probably what I should have done is written like Ying He and then had the apostrophe W with, with no brackets. Okay. Um, but I, but it felt, it felt wrong to kind of put the middle, the actual middle Chinese term there next to something that was not in fact it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I put the W's in, in, uh, yeah. in brackets. But no, it, it, these sound changes, you know, these sound changes on this slide are presented to be about hooko syllables only. And now we kind of uh, take a, a, a step back in terms of, you know, we started with the initials of Middle Chinese and we did some internal reconstruction on them and we came up with something. And then we added more proposals based on um, based on um, uh, Sheisheng series. So, uh, so where are we now? Yeah, well, let's look at uh, origins for the voiceless velar fricative. Uh, we have three that we've proposed, you know, in this presentation. One is from uh, <clears throat> voiceless uh, na, one is from voiceless ma, and one is from an aspirated uh, uvular stop. So um, Baxter and Cigar, again, like they did with, um, with initial yeah, they think, that's enough. You know, we have enough origins for um, for the voiceless velar fricative. So if a series has only velar readings, but some of those are X, then they reconstruct it to a uvular. Now, uh, let me kind of put that another way in terms of why is it worth mentioning this. If we have such a series, it's already conforming to the Sheisheng hypothesis, right? It has only uh, velars. So kind of from a naive methodological perspective, you could just leave it alone. Yeah, you, there's, no, there's no problem to fix. But if you had that approach, it would mean reconstructing X into old Chinese. So uh, we look at uh, one such series. Yeah, so uh, here's an, an example. We have this series. And in this series, you know, you have the, the the, the gamma initial and the X initial. And it's not a problem in terms of the Sheshang hypothesis, right? You, they are already homo organic. But um, uh, Baxter and Cigar's feeling is they don't want to reconstruct uh, uh, a, uh, a, an X and a gamma into Old Chinese when there's already the machinery available to explain where they come from. So it's just a sort of simpler explanation to take series like this back uh, to uvulars. And then the result is there are there is no X in Old Chinese. Right? That's, that's, their, um, uh, that's their conclusion. That's <clears throat> we managed to get rid of the X. So similarly, uh, we can look at uh, at Z. So Baxter projects initial Z in, in 1992. Baxter pro projects initial Z and ZR all the way back into Old Chinese. Uh, and Schussler also allows for Old Chinese Z, although it, uh, it it seems to me like it only comes up for him as some as a pre-initial before W. So that seems like a really weird um, uh, distribution. So uh, you know, I think he has some explaining to do there. But um, Baxter and Cigar uh, in 2014 uh, suggest uh, origins of uh, of Old Chinese uh, or, or of, of Z in Old Chinese. Uh, that involve uh, uh, clusters with S. So things like SB 
and you know S D and whatnot become uh, become Z in their um, in their uh, system. And I haven't gone into that because this presentation is about simplex initials and it's not about constant clusters. But it's just to tell you they have reason to to remove Z as a simplex initial. So um, kind of uh, summing this all up, uh, we, you know, what, what are the moves that we've, we've done? We've proposed laterals uh, in, in old Chinese uh, that explain these uh, de year connections in the series. We've proposed various kinds of voiceless resonance that um, clean up uh, various Sheisheng series. Uh, we've proposed uvulars. And then uh, we've removed x and we've removed z. So um, now I'm just going to whiz back to the summary uh, chart. Yeah, so this is the inventory of all Chinese initials that comes purely from internal reconstruction. And then you see that it's got the HJ initial still, and it's got the Y initial, and it's got the Z initial, and it's got an X, and it's got the labialized X, and it's got the labialized glob stop and the glob stop. So that's what we got when we just internally reconstructed Middle Chinese and then left it alone. But now we've managed to uh, you know, add the laterals, add the voiceless resonance, get rid of the X's, get rid of the glossops, get, get rid of the Z. And what does that give us? Let me just whiz ahead. Ah, here we get it. So this is the, uh, the type B initials of old Chinese as reconstructed by Baxter and Cigar. Uh, I only uh, feel inspired to make uh, one observation, which is they still have a glottal stop. And uh, I think this is something that they felt kind of of two minds about because you could take uh, the glottal stop back to um, uh, a, a uvular across the board, but they think that there, there's, there, there, that you can kind of see there's some Sheshang series that have glottal stops mixing with velars of the of the type that we. Uh, reconstruct um, uvulars for, uh, but they, they, they but there are also a, a, a few uh, uh, Sheshang series that are just glottal stops all the way through. So then they think, well, in order to kind of index that difference, why don't we keep the glottal stop as an initial? So they do, so they do that, and uh, and then you get the same stuff for uh, type B syllables, and those are all of the initials of, uh, of Old Chinese. The, 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 the pharyngealization is the, um, is the way Baxter and Cigar index uh, type A syllables, right? So they think type, type A syllables were pharyngealized and type B syllables were plain. And uh, as you see uh, from these, you know, kind of from, from all the stuff I'm talking about, this uh, A-B distinction has a huge effect on sound changes. Uh, and, you know, in terms of um, if something's type A, it does this. If it's on type B, it does this. So the, the, the and, and the predominant effect there is, um, is palatalization in type B. So there's a question you can ask yourself, which is like, like why did everything palatalize in type B? So the, the, uh, uh, the original proposal that uh, Baxter had in 1992 was everything's palatalized in type B because there was a palatal medial in type B. And that kind of follows on from Carlson. But it ends up being uh, not a very nice, um, proposal for one reason, because it means like half the syllables in the whole language had a medial ya in it. And that's just typologically bizarre, right? Whereas the pharyngealized, pharyngealized non-pharyngealized is a kind of contrast 
that you do get in languages at a kind of half-half ratio. So like particularly in Semitic languages, you have these emphatic and non-emphatic syllables. So um, that's maybe the closest point of comparison where type A would be emphatic and type B would be non-emphatic. And, um, and, and then the, the question is, well, why would all non-emphatic consonants palatalize generally? And um, this gets into some kind of areas of linguistics that I just am not super comfortable with in terms of you know, articulatory phonetics and whatnot. There are parallels in Arabic dialects, but there is a easy uh, or easy-ish thing to imagine, which is, um, if you have a pharyngeal, non-pharyngealized uh, distinction, uh, it has a, a, a quite a big, you know, semantic load, if you like. Uh, so over time, you are trying to keep like pharyngealized ba and um, and non-pharyngealized ba distinct. Yeah, and that will generally mean that the non-pharyngealized ba is kind of further forward in the mouth and the pharyngealized ba is further back in the mouth, and things that are further forward in the mouth might have then start to be indexed by palatalization. So that there's a kind of, uh, uh, let's think of it this way. At one point, the phonemic contrast was uh, pharyngealized, non-pharyngealized. Then the um, phonemic contrast, or, or then there's a subphonemic contrast, which is which is in order to keep them at the front of the face, uh, you start to get palatalization in the non-pharyngealized uh, syllables. And then at some point, you know, the, the next generation thinks uh, the contrast is between palatalized and non-palatalized. And then they reinterpret the pharyngealized, non-pharyngealized distinction as a palatalized, non-palatalized contrast. I think something like that is the, is the idea. Uh, and then something, but something to flag is, um, this reconstruction of Old Chinese is typologically bizarre because it has velar, uvular distinction and pharyngealized, non-pharyngealized distinction. So you have, you know, so you have pharyngealized velars and non-pharyngealized velars and you have pharyngealized uvulars and non-pharyngealized uvulars. And as far as I know, which is to say as far as is discussed in uh, the sinological literature, uh, no real languages are like them. Okay, so, you know, th this is not an uh, objection that Baxter and Cigar are naive to. What they point to is that um, the evidence for these two things, uh, a velar uvular contrast and an AB contrast, come from radically different time periods. So basically, the AB contrast comes from the, I mean, in a sense, from the rhyme uh, uh, tables even, but but probably, I mean, you can push it back to the rhyme books, yeah. So it, it's kind of late, whereas the uh, the uvular uh, velar distinction comes only from Shechong Su, so it's very early. So 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 their feeling is, look, we we don't really know what's going on. Uh, uh, which is to say, at the moment there was a, a uvular velar contrast, probably the AB distinction was something different than pharyngealization. But pharyngealization explains the palatalization. Uh, so, so probably it's something like there was, you know, there was this kind of primeval AB distinction that we really have no idea what it is. At the time, you had the uvular velar distinction. Then the uvulars were lost. Then the loss of the uvulars kind of allowed whatever the AB distinction was at that time to change into a pharyngealization distinction. And then you had the pharyngealization distinction until you uh, in, until that led to the sort of vowel warping and palatalization of the sort of early Han period. So that's. Uh, let's say I, I think that's the my best attempt to say what Baxter and Cigar think actually happened, and I uh, have done a little bit of work on this, uh, trying to kind of really pin down when did different sound changes happen, and I think it it, it sounds about right to me because you can imagine it something like 
uh, like this. Uh, as you saw that the, the, there's kind of simplifying a lot of issues, the uvulars generally turn into fricatives. Yeah, so you get, um, uh, you get uh, well, yeah, the uvulars tend to turn into fricatives. So I think that can also be understood as a kind of re-phonologization, re right? Which is that you had a, you had, you, at, at one point you had this nice uvular velar distinction, and then, you know, to speak a little tele teleologically, and then they decided we don't want that anymore. We're going to only have velars. And then the, uh, the uvular stops were reinterpreted as velar fricatives. And then you have that moment. Uh, and then at that moment, it's perfectly fine to have a, 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 a pharyngealized, non pharyngealized distinction. I mean, the, the way the, the the way things are usually presented, it's kind of the reverse, which is, so I don't like to talk in terms of marketness. I think it's kind of unhelpful generally, but I'll allow myself the indulgence at the moment, which is um, that the A-B distinction uh, before a certain moment, uh, uh, you had type B as unmarked and type A as marked with pharyngealization. But then at, a later moment that flipped and you get type A is unmarked and type B is marked with palatalization. And so um, if you want to kind of think of it in terms of, you know, features, I don't know, I don't know how to do this stuff, but actually like, you know, you have, uh, you have kind of uh, plus, uh, the, the plus pharyngealized becomes the, the minus palatalized. And, and the minus pharyngealized becomes the plus uh, palatalized. Um, but uh, but another way of putting it is like, it, you know, what's a good phonemic analysis of middle terms? And I just have to admit that that's not a question that interests me. Yeah. So uh, in in this presentation and in my book, for example, I just treat the rhyme categories of middle Chinese as as rhyme categories. You know, I I don't even try and figure out how many nuclear vowels there are in middle Chinese, you know, because I mean, and, and I would say this sort of, I don't know, in the same way that like, there are several different ways to phonologize uh, Putonghua, and that's kind of interesting. I mean, actually, it's interesting, methodologically speaking, it was very interesting, and in, in it was very important in the history of uh, phonemics as a discipline, right, that, that like, oh my god, there's more than one way to analyze the language. Um, I think that uh, middle Chinese looks like that to me, where it's kind of, well, you know, it's clearly Chinese. What to, what to say, <laughs> you know? And there's th that if you if you really want to think about well, what's in the medial and what's in the initial and how many vowels are there in one I, I think it starts to get a little bit, um, I don't know, dry. <laughs> but not not to say that you know my work isn't dry. But uh, the, the the analysis of Middle Chinese in terms of features or in terms of phonemes is just not something that excites me. So, um, but th but there's a huge literature on that kind of stuff. Let's try it again, sort of, you know, uh, once upon a time, there was a language that had a uvular velar distinction and half of its syllables were something and half of its syllables were something else. Maybe that was long and short vowels. Maybe that was uh, two syllable and, and one syllable. You know, th th these, are, these are existing proposals that some people believe. Um, who knows? Or, or yeah. let me just talk it through in terms of stages. You have, sort of sort of the real or stage, we'll call it sort of stage zero. We have a uvular velar distinction and some other distinction, yeah? Then at stage, uh, oh, and incidentally, we have no fricatives. Yeah, in, I mean, except S, yeah. Uh, and then we have uh, stage B, uh, or no, sorry, I switched from num numbers to letters. Okay, we have stage one, the first one stage zero. So now we have stage one. And in stage one, uh, we we no longer have uvulars, but we have got more fricatives. So we've got uh, we've got uh, velar fricatives in particular, but we've also got the glide yeah, which we might not have had before, or we might have had before. We don't know about that. Uh, and we and the second distinction, whatever it was, has now ch changed into a pharyngealized non-pharyngealized distinction. 
So, th so this is kind of stage one. Then at stage two, you have uh, you you still don't have uvulars. <laughs> you still have velar fricatives, uh, and you've lost pharyngealization, and you've gotten pallidus. And then what you're saying is at that moment, half of your syllables have a medial yeah. So so this whole pharyngealization theory has gotten us exactly nowhere. Okay, that's a reasonable point. It's not necessarily the case that at a segmental level at that moment, half of your syllables actually had a medial ya. It could be that, that what has happened is you have now dentals and palatal initials. That you, that it could be that you go, in a sense, straight from a pharyngealized, non-pharyngealized distinction to whatever happens immediately after this you know, imaginary moment where half the syllables have a ya without actually passing through the stage where half the syllables have a ya. Uh, yeah, that's a good question, actually. Um, so the question, in a way, is where did this pharyngealization idea come from? Uh, and uh, it comes from an article of Jerry Norman's. And so I would have to actually really look at what Jerry Norman proposed, but I will tell you something that's highly indicative. Uh, and I left it, uh, I didn't mention it earlier, I mean, because you can't mention everything, but also because I didn't want to confuse it with the uvular question. So now we have to say, forget that we ever knew anything about uvulars and the uvular hypothesis. So we're talking about something totally different, which is just the AB distinction. Okay. so. In early loans from Chinese to Hmong Mian, type B velars in Chinese are borrowed as Hmong Mian velars. Well, that's not a shock, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but type A velars are borrowed as Hmong Mian uvulars. So, that I think is, I mean, let's say, I think there are other arguments, but I think that that's the one that's stuck in my mind as that means that, that, that the allophonic distribution of velars in that moment in Chinese history was such that type A velars were, were perceived of by Hmong Yen speakers as usual. And uh, it's, it's completely normal in languages that have this kind of emphatic, non-emphatic distinction, to have the emphatic velars be phonetically realized as uvulars. I think that would be fine. Uh, so to put that another way, uh, A type A was uh, pharyngealized and type B was paddle. At, at the okay. same time, yeah, I think that's fine. And then, and then actually, it's quite sort of elegant because then you you just sort of drop the marking of the pharyngealization and you keep the palatalization, and then the palatalization moves from a feature associated with the syllable to a, a feature associated with the initial. That I think that's a beautiful explanation. Yeah, I think this is this very much uh, also seems to be the case to me. An extra stage um, uh, of some other previous contrasts, like pharyngealization, uh, it, it seems like a necessary complication because, uh, from my experience, uh, both uh, from you know how I've managed to analyze uh, the, the phonetics uh, of pharyngealization uh, and uh, palatalization myself, and from how um, what I've heard um, of other people. Uh, um, Say how they perceive both phenomena. Uh, it would seem that, um, and this ties into what you said, that indeed um, palatalization and pharyngealization are sort of opposites on the same spectrum, and uh, it, it's really about the phonetic contrast. And you know, speakers who are, for instance, more uh, used to um, a default, rather. Uh, 
palatalized uh, production of sounds, which doesn't mean that they use some kind of a year glide. No, that 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 is a uh, um, that you know that 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 is not part of it. Uh, but you know they perceive sounds that are less palatalized as being utilized. For instance, you know in, in Russian. Um, we we have the the sort of the so-called palatals and the 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 normal consonants. Now, some foreigners uh, experience our normal unmarked uh, stops as actually being uh, sort of uvular. So I think it's 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 as much about the perception of the people who um, um, have a different. Uh, who position their uh, unmarkedness uh, at a different point in, in that spectrum, that that has as much to do um, with the, 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 you know, palatalization or velarization or parentalization of sounds as, as actual sound production does. And in this case, uh, I don't think you really need to assume this second later stage of um, parentalization uh, in an earlier um, period, uh, because I mean, ultimately, it's it's about it's about a, a phonetic contrast. And if you look at, um, um, I mean, I mean, you, you don't you don't really find pharyngealization much, I think, um, in, um, in in northern or eastern Asia, whereas uh, palatalization does occur a lot. And and then again, uh, maybe something else to think about is. Uh, uh, sort of the vowel, har the vowel harmonies, which are, are actually evolve vowels more than consonants. Um, so yeah, uh, but basically, yeah. My main point is that exactly. I wanted to re reinforce your uh, suspicion that, which is also my suspicion as of already a few years, that so-called palatalization and pharyngealization are just opposites, and um, you know, in very basic terms, phonetically, uh, palatalization what people call palatalization involves uh, somewhat a constriction of the air passage with, uh, in most cases, a yeah, promotion of, 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 of the tongue. Um, although in the case of the, the velars, for instance, um, yeah, the, the tongue is actually pulled kind of uh, up and backwards a bit, but in the end, it still achieves um, a hollower um, um, mouth cavity, whereas for instance, if you, if you look at um, the, the, the Arabic emphatics, they actually produce a much greater volume of the cavity. Um, you know, you could uh, you, know, you, you could also kind of translate uh, this contrast figuratively onto sort of, you know, and this will maybe sound a bit uh, crude, but you know, the, the, the more feminine and the more masculine sounds. And, 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 and you can see how easily how that becomes a continuum. Yeah, so can I jump in here? So just a few observations. Uh, what? Uh, so if I can concretely paraphrase what you're saying, uh, there's one particular um, claim that I think is, is, is useful to highlight, which is that uh, you could have had the old Chinese uh, in, in, let's say, the post-uvular era, but the pre-palatalization -palatal as a sound change era. Yeah. Um, you could have had them speaking Russian and have the Hmong Mians still borrow type A velars as uvulars because of because of how they perceive the contrast in in old Chinese. I think that's a very important point. It has not been sufficiently uh, understood in the literature, which is to say, yeah, I think there has been a sense that, well, if the Hmong Mian borrowed these things as a uh, as uh, as a uvular velar, then they must have been somehow uvular velar. Whereas you're saying, no, that's perfectly consistent with them being sort of velar and palatalized velar. So yes, fine. If, if, yeah. if, 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 if their velars uh, were mostly sort of palatal velars, then a normal velar to them would sound like something that's really from- Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that sounds fine. Um, then I, I do have a slight objection to your sort of I don't know. In the Middle East, you uvularize, and in Asia, you palatalize. That's a that's a you know that's a caricature. 
But my understanding is that actually a lot of Mongolian uh, vowel harmony has to do with, you know, plus minus ATR, which is something I don't, I, I don't, I've never even, I've never understood what, what it means for me to advance my tongue word. I just don't relate to my tongue in that way. But, um, uh, but uh, the, or I don't even know, it's, uh, but the, the back vowel, yeah, the back, the, ve the velars in Mongolian uh, back vowel uh, words are pronounced phonetically as uvulars. So, um, so I think, let's put it this way, that, that I, I, I object to your sense of, you know, palatalization is somehow more likely than uvularization. But I completely agree with you that it's kind of six and one, half a dozen of another, and is and and all of these things, uvularization, palatalization, and vowel harmony are sort of mixed up together in a bucket. Yeah. No, all, 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 I'm, all I'm saying is, you, I mean, you you would have to actually, I think, find some uh, examples of East Asian languages, uh, or at least you know, languages sort of to the east, uh, maybe of the Zagros Mountains, that uh, actually engage in. Uh, Something like you know the examples that you draw you and uh, Mark uh, whose presentation I also watched they, they draw on examples from Arabic but I mean look let, let, let's be honest I mean the distance and oh the, sure I but no I don't think I, are, that's just a that's just a typological argument of this can happen it's not an argument of contact yeah um, but I would say that um, actually you know what I would point to you know which I think is the best thing to point to is the Gyaronic languages have. Uh, let's say, depending on the Galvanic language, uvular velar contrast and a, uh, a, a systematic uh, sort of uh, contrast on the vowel between uh, what they call velarized and unvelarized. Now, I, I, I'm not a phonetician, so I don't have a good sense of how pharyngealization is different than velarization. Gong Shun actually has done some work on this, uh, both in terms of Tonga and in terms of Chinese, that is unpublished uh, and I don't think is particularly likely to be published soon. It would be nice, you know, to ask him about it. Um, but, uh, but, but here's, I think, the crux of the issue is, is at some point in Chinese history, you start getting mergers, right? Which you, you start getting like uh, the, the, you start getting the, let's say, the type A voiceless nasal and the type A voiceless lateral merging as T, and you start and you get the type B voiceless. Um, uh, lateral and the type B voiceless nasal merging as sha, right? So, so I think there's just a question, you know, kind of, I don't know, to those of you who are phonetically sophisticated about like what kind of thing would go on that would make those mergers happen. And, and, and we can call those palatalization not in the sense of, you know, synchronic palatalization, but in terms of diachronic palatalization. So that's you know, the A-B distinction triggered those mergers. And then the question is, um, let's say, really from the Sino-Tibetan perspective, like really, really old, what should we do with this A-B distinction? Which is to say, you know, I'm, I feel like, look, at, well, at one point it's palatalization. At one point, it's very unlikely to be uh, pharyngealization because we've reconstructed uvular contrast. So I basically agree with you and with Sid, then maybe it's a little unhelpful to reconstruct it as uh, pharyngealization. You should just, if, if, like, just keep it as palatalization or figure out what it actually comes from. Uh, but we do need to figure out what it actually comes from. And, and then again, I mean, why should we be uncomfortable with just a system of six vowels as opposed to three vowels that uh, are governed by these two types? I mean, if you look at- No, we, uh, well, that, no that's, that's wrong. We have six vowels with, 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 both types. Okay. So okay. let's say, which is to say, um, you, you, I would prefer to understand pharyngealization. So we'll just say the type A, type B distinction as mm -hmm. uh, linked to the whole syllable. Uh, but Baxter and Sagar link it to the initial, and then they come up with this very gorgeous list of initials. That's fine with me. Uh, but if you linked it to the vowels, then we would have a 12 vowel response. Super, super easy. Um, so this is Roman. This is, goes back to Roman Jakobson, where basically he says P's and K's 
I call grave, you know, T's, T's and the like, I call acute. It's, I mean, you can really think of it as a purely terminological issue. And it's just that many, many sound changes are conditioned by this difference, right? That like that velars and labials behave one way and that sort of dentals and appricates and retroflex behave another way. So it, it just simplifies the discussion of historical phonology immensely. If you can just say grave, acute, grave, acute. Um, I mean, and, and, and then there is, a, there is a question that, uh, which is, is there a reality behind this? And I believe there is, uh, and, and it's, it's not articulatory, it's acoustic, right? Which is why you get things like, uh, you know, labial velars turning into labials in Greek and whatnot. So there's some kind of acoustic thing having to do with formants that, you know, the people, kind of people who care about that stuff, <laughs> you can ask about that. You know, which is, I, I think it's a real difference in terms of acoustic phonetics between grave and, and uh, acute, but we don't have to treat it that way. We can treat it as just a, a kind of terminological thing. You know, like, uh, let's say Baxter says there aren't very many and forget about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so it's a, it's a philological question. And actually, you know, if anyone write, wants to write a, a paper, you know, uh, for this class, I know that's an option. Uh, or you know, in life, um, it would be uh, interesting to look at all of these types of syllables that we're choosing to ignore. You know, the the the, the Laimu division two initials, the 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 Kaiko uh, Yunmu uh, initials. There's there's various kind of small classes of of, of phenomena in in the Guanyin that that historical Chinese phonology tends to ignore. And then it's it, it's a it's a philological question of like. Can those examples actually be explained? Because if they can't be, they shouldn't be ignored. Uh, basically, th they think that a, a loose pre-initial before a, a uvular uh, changes uh, the um, the uvular into a velar, and then the the, the loose pre-initial is lost. And this is something we'll get to uh, not at the next no, maybe in the next lecture, maybe in the next. Um, and and I'll tell you that that to me this really feels like they have too many tools in the toolbox. It's like oh well you know if if it's if it's like whack a mole or something. It's like well if this comes up you hit it with this, and then if this comes up you hit it with this. <laughs> and um and uh you know actually one way of thinking about this is like if you if you so we've tried to formalize. But we, I don't even know what I mean by that. I, I and some people who help me do things that I'm unable to do myself um, uh, have tried a little bit to formalize these sound changes with uh, with finite state transducers. And the and the nice thing about a finite state transducer is that you can run them backwards, right? So you can say, okay, uh, rather than always thinking like, okay, if 